January 11th, 2024 afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good afternoon. Please call the roll. Good afternoon. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Gonzalez. Here. Epps. Here. Taylor. Here. And before we jump in, we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before Council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the Council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with City Council can be found on the Council Clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during City Council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, one, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Two, disclose if you're a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. Three, for testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. All right, thank you. Before we, well, let's let's read the item first, then we'll get to the details. Item 35, please, Keelan. Consider appeal by the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association against the hearings officer's decision to approve with conditions a conditional use master plan and adjustment review for improvements to athletic facilities at Jackson Middle School, LU 22-185-273-CUMSAD. All right, and colleagues, this is a formal land use hearing, so there are certain procedures we'll follow. So before we get into this, uh, the city attorney will make some announcements. Good afternoon. This is an on the record hearing. This means you must limit your testimony to material and issues in the record. For an on the record hearing, we begin with a staff report by Bureau of Development Services staff for approximately 10 minutes. Following staff report, council will hear from interested persons in the following order. The appellant will go first and will have 10 minutes to present their case. Following the appellant, persons who support the appellant will go next. Each person will have three minutes to speak to council. The applicant will then have 15 minutes to address City Council and rebut the appellant's presentation. After the applicant, uh, the Council will hear from persons who support the applicant. Again, each person will have three minutes. Finally, the appellant will have five minutes to rebut the presentation of the applicant. Council may then close the hearing, deliberate, and take a vote on the appeal. If the vote is a tentative vote, council will set a future date for the adoption of findings and a final vote on the appeal. If council takes a final vote today, that will conclude the matter before council. I'd like to announce several guidelines for those who will be addressing council today. First, the evidentiary record is closed. This is an on the record hearing. The hearing is to decide only if the hearings officer made the correct decision based on the evidence presented to them. This means you must limit your remarks to arguments based on the record compiled by the hearings officer. You may refer to evidence that was previously submitted to the hearings officer. You may not submit new evidence today that was not submitted to the hearings officer. If your argument includes new evidence or issues, you may be interrupted and reminded that you must limit your testimony to the record. The council will not consider the new information and it will be rejected in the city council's final decision. Two, objections to new evidence. If you believe a person who addressed City Council today improperly presented new evidence or presented a legal argument that relies on evidence that is not in the record, you may object to that argument. Three, objection to new issues. Finally, under state law, only issues that are raised before the hearings officer may be raised in this appeal to City Council. If you believe another person has raised issues today that were not raised before the hearings officer, you may object to Council's consideration of that issue. Fourth, the applicant must identify constitutional challenges to conditions of approval. If the applicant fails to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with enough specificity to allow the council to respond, the applicant will be precluded from bringing an action in dam for damages in circuit court. 
And finally, I will note, because we are um, in a hybrid hearing, that the representatives of the applicant and the appellant are participants on this Zoom meeting and have the ability to raise procedural or other objections. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes my remarks. All right. Thank you. A couple questions for the council. Do any members of the council wish to declare a conflict of interest? If so, could you raise your hand, please? No member of the council has a conflict of interest to declare. Do any members of the council have ex, ex parte contacts to declare or information gathered outside of this hearing that they need to disclose? No council members have ex parte contacts to declare. Have any council members made any visits to the site involved in this manner, in this matter? I'm not seeing anybody raise their hand. Does anyone present in the council chambers or uh, Commissioner Ryan? Uh, well, yeah, I've been to the site many times. Uh, this is Jackson Middle School, was Jackson High School. So in my engagement with the schools as a school board member, I've been to that location many times. All right, thank you. Uh, does anybody wish uh, who's online or uh, in the chambers, does anybody present wish to ask any commissioner uh, particularly Commissioner Ryan, about his or her observations on the site visit. Keelan, can you tell me if anybody raises their hand? <clears throat> no one has raised their hand. Very good. So we'll begin the hearing. Please remember that everybody testifying or presenting a legal argument must conclude their testimony within the allotted time. In addition, only evidence submitted to the hearing officer may be considered by counsel. Any new evidence offered should either be rejected or accepted subject to later rejection if it's determined to be new evidence. All right, so first we'll hear the staff report. Andy Galicia, City Land Use Planner with BDS is here to present, I believe. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, thank you. So I will share my screen. And Andy, we'll, we'll give you 10 minutes. Uh, Keelan will keep a timer. If you go over, uh, then we'll give the appellant additional time so that, that they have um, the same opportunity. Understood. Thank you. So I am uh, Andy Galizia. I'm a planner with the Bureau of Development Services. I'm going to summarize the hearings officer's findings for the conditional use master plan and adjustment review that's under appeal today. So the subject site is the Jackson Middle School campus in Southwest Portland, and the review is primarily focused here on the western part of the site. This photo shows the northwest corner of the site at the intersection of Southwest 40th and Alfred Streets. This is where phase one of the proposal would improve the playing field that you see here. Phase one is to install synthetic turf on this main field here, which would be used for baseball, softball, and soccer, and two youth soccer fields to the west of the main field would remain as grass. New field lighting is proposed around the synthetic turf field. Existing spectator seating, which you can see here, would remain, but no new spectator seating is proposed. And phase one also includes a new six-space parking lot and a single-story building for storage and batting cages to the south of the field. Phase two of the proposal is in the southwest corner of the site, which is shown here. Phase two is to regrade this area with either natural turf or synthetic turf. The school district wanted to maintain that option for this second phase, and this field would be used for softball and soccer. No field lights or spectator seating are proposed for this area, and phase two also includes two new tennis courts to the north of the phase two field. The subject site is zoned OS or open space, which allows recreational fields for organized sports through conditional use review. The applicant requested a conditional use master plan, which is a type of conditional use review that allows the improvements to be phased in over a maximum 10 year period. I want to note that on this zoning map, which was in effect when this application was submitted, the only environmental overlay zone area on the site is here at the very north end of the property, right about here, and no improvements or work is proposed in this area. There is a new environmental overlay zone 
approximately in this area toward the center of the site. But this application is not subject to the new environmental overlay zone because the application was submitted before this went into effect. So this is not a natural area. This is where the existing tennis courts are. But this tennis court area is a depression in the ground that has been identified as a wetland. The school district has already submitted a site development permit application to the city to remove these two tennis courts and to place fill over this wetland. That permit is still under review at this time. Uh, drainage requirements are a big part of that review and state approval is also required to fill a wetland. But like this conditional use master plan application, that site development permit was submitted before the new environmental overlay zone took effect over this area. And since the site development permit doesn't require or trigger any land use review, it's proceeding on a separate path from this land use application. So I think it's important to point out that if this land use review is denied, the school district actually could still continue with the site development permit to place fill here if they chose to do that. These are the approval criteria for a conditional use master plan. For criterion A, the hearings officer found the application contains all the components required. Criterion B requires compliance with the conditional use approval criteria, which I'll go over next. And for criterion C, the proposal complies with all applicable zoning regulations except for two adjustments, which the hearings officer approved, which I will go over in a moment. So there are four conditional use approval criteria that apply in the OS zone. Criterion A addresses the character factors listed here on this slide. The hearings officer found this criterion was met. The proposal expands opportunities for outdoor recreation, which is part of the purpose for the OS zone. A majority of the site area will remain as grassy areas and tree groves. Only seven trees would be removed for the project, but the project includes dozens of new trees to be planted throughout the site. Criterion B is about the adequacy of public services to support the proposal. The Portland Bureau of Transportation, or PBOT, the Water Bureau, the Police and Fire Bureaus, and the Bureau of Environmental Services, or BES, all found public services to be adequate, so the hearings officer found this criterion was met. Criterion C is about livability impacts on the residential neighborhoods, specifically in terms of the factors listed here on this slide. The hearings officer found there would be no significant adverse impacts related to any of these factors. The lights around the one lighted field would be turned off by 10 p.m. and there would be very little light spill on neighboring properties when those lights are in use. No public address system would be used and no additional spectator seating is proposed. Criterion D is about the proposal's consistency with the applicable policies of the Southwest Community Plan. The hearings officer found the proposal was consistent with these policies. The proposal would expand recreation opportunities. Most of the site would remain open and many more trees would be planted than removed. BES found the watershed would be adequately protected and PBOT found the transportation system was adequate for the proposal. And PBOT also recommended a condition of approval, which the hearings officer adopted to require a public walkway connection through the site from Southwest 40th to Southwest 35th. The applicant also requested two adjustments to zoning code requirements for the project and the hearings officer approved both of those. The first adjustment is to modify the landscape buffering requirement on the south side of the existing driveway and parking lot, which is here on this aerial photo and shown here on this photograph and on the north side of the existing driveway to the north of the school building, which is here on this aerial photo and right here on this photograph. Without this adjustment, the school district would need to plant formal rows of tall shrubs in these two locations to meet the non-conforming upgrades requirement that construction of the sports fields would trigger for the existing development on the site. The hearings officer found that new shrubs were not necessary in these two locations to meet the purpose of the buffering requirement for vehicle areas. The second adjustment is to the 50 foot structure height limit. This is to allow the new light poles around the field in the northwest corner of the site to be between 60 and 90 feet tall. The hearings officer approved this because the additional height would allow the lights to be aimed more directly downward toward the field, which would minimize the light spill outside the field area, and because new and existing trees would soften views toward the new light poles from neighboring homes. So the hearings officer's decision was to approve the conditional use master plan and both of the adjustment requests subject to 11 conditions of approval, which are summarized here on this slide. 
These conditions are intended to control and to mitigate some of the potential impacts of the project and to require the school district to construct public improvements in addition to the athletic facilities. So a few things I'd like to respond to in relation to some of the objections that have been raised about the project. Uh, the hearings officer did find that the proposal was consistent with all aspects of the purpose statement of the OS zone. That finding was based partly on the fact that a majority of the site area would remain as undeveloped land with grass and trees, and that's not including any of the sports fields, even if, if those fields were grass. There was also a suggestion that the Southwest Community Plan is not being correctly applied in this case because the plan includes a policy calling for stormwater runoff volumes to be reduced. So the appellant suggests the application should be denied unless there's less runoff from the artificial turf than there is from the existing grass. Uh, BDS has not interpreted this to compare development proposals to greenfield conditions in that way. Certainly stormwater management is relevant, but we don't only allow development that has no greater runoff than an undeveloped area. Another way to look at this is to consider if this proposal was for a large school building in this part of the site instead of for sports fields. Uh, we would require stormwater management to be addressed for the new roof area, but we generally wouldn't require that building to have no greater runoff than a grassy field of the same size in order to consider that building consistent with the Southwest Community Plan. And there were a lot of comments about technical aspects of grading and stormwater management that some members of the public suggest the hearings officer did not adequately consider. Uh, one thing that was stated is that a geotechnical report was not submitted. In fact, there was a geotechnical report submitted at the beginning of this process into the land use record. But I wanna clarify the hearings officer did not review and approve all of the technical details that will ultimately apply, apply to construction projects um, the hearings officer approved a 10-year land use plan that would allow the sports fields to be constructed in the locations the applicant proposed. Part of the hearings officer's decision relied on the fact that BES had evaluated the proposal and found that stormwater runoff can be managed in a way that will protect water quality in the watershed and that will not contribute to flooding. If this project is approved, uh, BES will also review detailed stormwater management plans for each building permit for the project. Uh, the BES reviewer for this application is attending the hearing today in case there are any questions about the stormwater findings or stormwater recommendations. And finally, I just want to reiterate that this being an on the record hearing, um, the city attorneys and I will cooperate and try to flag any evidence for you that's presented that should be discarded because it's new. Uh, thanks very much. All right, thank you. Now the appellant will have 10 minutes to present. Welcome representatives of the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association. And if you wouldn't mind, if you could just, as you speak, if you could introduce yourselves, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, council. My name is Javier Moncada. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, Hi. loud and clear. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> uh, Good afternoon, Council. My name is Javier Mancada and I am the president of the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association. Thank you for considering our appeal. The West Portland Park Neighborhood Association has a long history of community <clears throat> activism to protect watershed health. Our neighborhood sits at the divide of the Fano Creek and Tryon Creek watersheds with headwater creeks feeding streams flowing into the Tualatin River to the west and to the Willamette River to the east. Falling Creek, uh, which runs through and under the site is one of those headwaters. Neighborhood association leaders were co-founders of the Tryon Creek Watershed Council in the 1990s, and we advocate successful for, successfully for inclusion of the Tryon Creek linkages in the 1995 Metro Green Spaces bond measure. For many years, parents, parent volunteers taught Jackson Middle School students how to measure water quality in Falling Creek. We are not new to the work uh, to protect watershed health. Many of our members were, are, and will be parents of students at the Jackson Middle School we fully support the goal of improving the facilities at the school. The relevant approval criteria in this application require that the renovations must not be at the expense of the watershed health or public access to the grounds. The key issue in this appeal proposes installs over seven acres of plastic artificial turf where current conditions are natural grass. We believe that this is inconsistent with several approval criteria. The key issue in this appeal is the applicant's proposal. The evidence in the record of this application must demonstrate that all approval criteria are met. Each and every approval criteria must be met. If 
Even one is not met and cannot be met by additional conditions of approval, the application must be denied. We believe that this application fails to meet the approval criteria in code section 33.815.100, use in the open space zone, section D area plans, which states the proposal is, is consistent with any area plans adopted by the council as part of the comprehensive plan, such as neighborhood or community plans. The hearings officer determined that the Southwest community plan policies and objectives are relevant approval criteria. We agree. The Southwest community plan parks, recreation, and open space policy objectives. Two requires preserve natural areas for wildlife habitat, envi habitat, environmental, and scenic views. While grass is not a native vegetation, it is a natural plant that provides wildlife habitat and environmental values. Grass filters, stormwater removal, removing pollutants and takes in surface water and releases it into releases it as natural vapors. Grass stays cool in the summer, is habitat for invertebrates and insects and filters residue from dog waste left on the surface. Plastic surf, plastic turf provides none of those benefits. It is extremely hot in the summer, which is a huge concern given both global warming and the listening of temperatures as pollutants of concerns in the Tryon Creek watersheds. Fecal material draining through it will add to the E. coli load, which is also listed in the Tryon Creek. My kids play soccer on this and uh, they get burned when they play on, on, on um, AstroTurf. Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policy Objective 1A requires preventing any not degrade, degrading of water quality, aquatic and streamlined plants and animal habitats and ecosystems, channel stability and watershed health. Section 1C requires reduced volume, velocity, pollutant load of stormwater runoff entering streams and 1D mandates improved dry seasonal stream flows, particularly in headwater areas. Compared with current conditions, the proposal, if approved, will not comply with these policies and objectives. The hearings officer claims on page six regarding pollution in the watershed. Some comments mention pollution in the Tryon Creek watershed and speculates that the Jackson Middle School site is filtered site for these contaminants. The hearings officer finds no evidence in the record, which suggests that there is pollution in the larger watershed that is filtered on this site. This argument misses the point that there is currently no artificial turf on this site. The proposal, if approved, will introduce more than seven acres of plastic to this site. Documents in the record cite studies showing that artificial turf leaches microplastics into the total, to, total suspended solids. The hearings officer asserts on page eight of this decision, quote, the selection of this turf product will be required to comply with an operational and water quality and quantity standards of the city of Portland, uh, which is from the stormwater manual, stormwater management manual, unquote. The ND, and indeed the applicant proposes that as a condition of, of approval after the neighborhood association and the Tryon Creek Watershed Council documented concerns about water quality. Condition J requiring a stormwater management plan that complies with all the applicable water quality and water quantity requirements include total maximum daily loads of the storm water management manual. The problem with this condition is that it does not ensure the policies of the Southwest community plan uh, are met. The storm water management manual requires water quality treatment to remove only 70% of the total suspended solids, allowing 30% of the newly introduced microplastics leaching from the turf to flow into Falling Creek and will increase water pollution, not, decrease, not decreasing it as required by the Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policy and Objectives. Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policy Objective 4, promote maintenance and restoration of the urban forest and use of native vegetation in headwater areas with the uplands forest and along riparian and stream corridors. This is a particularly important given that this is Falling Creek headwater area the fact that the creek is buried in a pipe below the sports field is irrelevant. It's still a stream corridor and surface waters both before and after the pipe. While grass is not native vegetation, it is vegetation. Artificial turf is neither native or vegetation. It provides no environmental, no environmental benefit. Um, the fact that 
this is part of Falling Creek Headwaters is relevant to the stormwater management manual requirements standard 1.3.4 level one groundwater separation requirements, which requires new surface infiltration facilities are required to have a minimum separation distance of five feet between the bottom of the facility and the seasonal high groundwater level unless otherwise approved by PES. The groundwater level is at the surface during the rainy season. The application cites that the mud and poor drainage as a, as a reason to switch to artificial turf. The stormwater draining from uphill areas to the west flows to Falling Creek where it would be if it hasn't if it wasn't in the pipe. The standards won't be met. The stormwater management manual refers to vegetated stormwater treated facilities, yet none are proposed. The manual states in section 1.3.2 facility selection, vegetation and infiltration, and I quote, the city stormwater management approaches approach prioritizes vegetation and infiltration to meet stormwater requirements and to maximize environmental systems and urban design benefits. Designers must evaluate and use vegetation and infiltration facilities to use maximum extended practicality. Vegetation and infiltration to provide numerous environmental benefits. Vegetation and infiltration facilities in the built environmental minimizes the environments to, of development or natural resources and the city's built storm systems. They are also more resilient than other stormwater management methods, i.e., example, structural detention facilities or manufactured treatments. To changes in hydrology anticipated due to climate change, vegetation provides habitat for wildlife and scenic aesthetics and health benefits for humans. Infiltration of stormwater provides hydrological, ben hydrological benefits, uh, better mimicking natural hydrological, hydrological processes, recharging groundwater, providing summer base flows and streams, and reducing downstream flooding. The combination of soils, plants, and biological activity in vegetated facilities removes stormwater volumes through retention and evapotranspiration and filters and that degrade pollutants, keeping them in the city system and the natural environment. And so the application has not demonstrated that the proposal can comply with the stormwater management plan. It fails to prove that Southwest community plan policies and objectives are or can be met in the evidence in the record. The application must be denied. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to keep the rest of my time to the, re move the rest of my time to the, re the rebuttal. Uh, Amanda Fritz, Vice President of West Portland Park Neighbor Association will be doing the rebuttal statement. Thank you. All right, thank you. And, and by that, I assume you mean after the testimony, is that correct? She'll be coming at the end? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, so then now we'll hear testimony from supporters of the appellant. That means people who largely agree with what Javier just said. Keelan, how many testifiers in support of the appellant do we have signed up today? Uh, we have 22 signed up. 22 signed up. All right. And uh, it is a requirement of this process that each person have three minutes to speak and no longer. Uh, I'll go ahead and let you, Keelan, call on individuals, three minutes each, and please just state your name for the record. You do not need to state your address. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we have Alexis Barton. Hi there. Give me just a moment to get my screen set up, please. Thank you. Um, hello, um, my name is Alexis. I'm the coordinator for the nonprofit Tryon Creek Watershed Council. And as you've heard, um, stormwater in this project is Falling Creek. So as you saw in the screen share of the zoning map, Falling Creek flows above ground before entering the pipe that runs under across campus. And downstream, it directly becomes Tryon Creek. So in watersheds, what happens upstream affects what happens downstream. And downstream here is the creek with a really healthy coastal cutthroat trout population and which we together, meaning the city of Portland and partners such as nonprofits, are together working to reopen access for endangered salmon into. 
Um, this application has been able to proceed regardless of the current e-zones that span the site and demonstrate what we all know, that there's a wetland and a creek here. We, we know that this isn't enforceable here, but this overarching piece is worth saying because it underscores the necessity of your really examining critically if these specific environmental concerns are satisfied. We don't think that they are. You'll hear more from our board members and others with specificity to this end. The Southwest Community Plan, which is um, valid and relevant to this project as approval criteria, it says to prevent net degradation of water quality, to minimize risk to public safety, private property, and public infrastructure, and to reduce runoff pollutant loads. What we're looking at is instead the addition of seven acres of plastic, which will introduce a pollutant load and is paired with an insufficient stormwater filtration system. All of this is weighted on top of the conveyance pipe, the pipe that moves Falling Creek through the property and is known to be in disrepair. The stormwater systems engineers and company have shared concerns about the ineffectiveness of their cartridges that are planned in this project. And the pipe itself is just stated is in a known state of disrepair and it runs alongside the sewer pipe, which would already be replaced if this project proceeds. So when we say that we only need to avoid net degradation for a system that's already degraded or functioning poorly, it's just going to perpetuate the existing inadequacies, right? This is why we feel that the hearings officer erred too heavily in, um, excuse me, erred in relying too heavily on the stormwater management manual um, when it doesn't meet the policies of the Southwest Community Plan, which are required approval criteria. Um, the suggested conditional uses that you'll hear today are logical and imperative. When we know better, we do better. Um, we know we should do better per the e-zones and watershed science and the Southwest Community Plan is what provides you with the authority to do better here. Thank you. Next up, we have Rebecca Crosby. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for taking the time. Can you all hear me? Okay, yeah, great. Loud and clear. Can you see me? No. You okay. Can't. Okay, I can see my camera's not coming on for some reason, but I'm just going to go ahead and um, um, I'm with the Watershed Council as well. My name is Rebecca Crosby. I've been a board member with the Friends of Tryon Creek in the past, and I'm currently on um, the Tryon Creek Watershed Council. I've lived in this area for a long time, and so I have an appreciation for the importance of protecting our streams and tributaries that feed into Tryon Creek. I don't. I know there's a lot of people that want to testify today. Um, I did want to talk about the the pipe that moves Falling Creek under the Jackson Fields, Jackson Middle School Fields, because I think it's important that the average uh, synthetic turf can have as much as 40,000 pounds of plastic carpet and 400,000 pounds of infill. And I have concerns that this weight that is going to be placed on top of an aging pipe would further degrade the pipe um, that moves the water um, a falling creek underneath Jackson Middle School. Um, and I also have concerns with Portland Public School moving forward using old science when they're supposed to be, uh, I feel like Portland Public School should be using best scientific practices moving forward. They're an educational institution. And I think it's incumbent that we make choices that help support the environment. Um, it's important that we that the water doesn't get contaminated with microplastics and this and I submitted testimony um, to the hearings officer on this and um, and I, there's a lot of people talking about the the that the need to use the fields for the athletics but while in one season maybe the fields are getting too wet and in a different season the fields are going to be too hot and one way to cool fields down artificial turf when it gets so hot is with water um, and or providing shade whereas natural grass turf um, doesn't get too hot in the sun and doesn't really need to be watered in the summertime because it just will come back uh, in the fall when the rains come. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Betty McArdle. Good afternoon. 
My name is Betty McArdle. I have lived in this neighborhood for 43 years and own my own home. Pertinent to this testimony, I have more than 30 years of experience working on environmental issues. I fully support West Portland Park Neighborhood Association's appeal. The hearings officer erred when claiming the applicant demonstrated compliance with relevant approval criteria for the open space zone. He limited his focus to opportunities for outdoor recreation. The 33.100.010 open space zone purpose statement lists seven purposes for the zone. The hearings officer ignored preserving scenic qualities, protecting sensitive or fragile environmental areas, enhancing and protecting the values and functions of trees, and preserving the capacity and water quality of the stormwater drainage system. The hearings officer describes phase two as regrading two existing soccer fields in the southwest part of the site with natural turf or synthetic turf to accommodate overlapping softball and soccer fields. The assertion that Portland Schools proposed development is a field improvement and or replacement project is a misrepresentation of facts concerning the development as a whole. Exhibit A18 and stormwater report exhibit A21 show phase two asks to develop three new sports fields using synthetic turf. These fields do not currently exist and are therefore not improvements or enhancements. This application relies on separating the phase two ball fields and tennis courts from the associated site development permit. The hearings officer erred by not reviewing and comparing the CUMP site plans for phase two with the associated site development plans for the tennis courts. The applicant seeks to separate the two, but this is a site master plan. All proposed development should be included in your evaluation. We all want more sports fields for kids organized sports and an area for neighbors to go for a walk or enjoy a pickup game of softball. But this proposal is not the right way to do it. Thank you. And I reserve my additional time for the rebuttal. Next up, uh, Lynn Andron. Hi, my name is Lynn Andron, and I've lived next door to Jackson Middle School for over 50 years. The hearings officer errs by conflating recreational fields for organized sports with open space outdoor recreation and not applying the full scope of open space environmental protections. Referencing Table 101, Open Space Primary Uses, 33100B2, designates recreational fields for organized sports as an accessory use for special with special in limitations under 33-920-460 parks and open areas, and it must be consistent with 33100 open space purpose and primary use desired in natural character. An accessory use of 33910 definitions is subordinate to the primary use of protecting sensitive or fragile environmental areas. Sports fields are secondary and non-essential when considered in the context of the open space purpose and primary use prioritizing the natural environment and ecological functioning of the ecosystem. The primary use of the open space zone specifies the intention is preserving and enhancing open and natural areas in relation to providing opportunities for outdoor recreation by protecting sensitive or fragile environmental areas and scenic qualities, and to preserve the capacity and water quality of the stormwater drainage system. BDS clearly establishes the significant functional value of Falling Creek integral to the Greater Tryon Creek watershed in their pre-application response noting, quote, Falling Creek, a headwater to Tryon Creek is piped and runs south to north underneath the current fields and it states the creek has highly significant resource value. The primary use and the purpose of 33110 open space criteria does not stipulate that protecting sensitive or fragile environmental areas is only applicable to environmental overlays. Rather, it broadly commands the protection of sensitive or fragile environmental areas. BDS's pre-application response exhibit 130 required PPS to address 33815 conditional use review stipulating, quote, 
for approval criterion A, character and impacts, please refer to the purpose statement for the open space zone in 33110. Note that protecting sensitive environmental areas is part of the purpose of the open space zone. So please explain how impacts to environmental resources will be minimized and or mitigated, even if resources are not protected by a city environmental overlay zone at the time of your application. An adequate response to this criterion should also explain how the proposal minimizes and retains an open natural character for the site. And the application does not do that. Thank you. And any time I have left over, we go to rebuttal. And Keelan, and Keelan can I just make a clarification here with folks? Um, the don't don't necessarily rush through your testimony with the expectation that time goes to rebuttal. It doesn't doesn't work that way. You get up to three minutes, and uh, you can use the three minutes or not use the three minutes. But nobody else gets to use your three minutes. I I just want to be really clear on that point. Next up, we have Madeline Dinko. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. You sound okay. good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name is Madeline Denko, and I'm a longtime resident of West Portland Park. Uh, BDS and Exhibit A5, which was from our uh, from testimony in the uh, session with the hearings officer, required a geotechnical letter providing an assessment of fill placement, demonstrating the impact that fill surcharge loads would have on the existing BES gravity sewer line that bisects the Jackson site as well as site grading plans and engineering calculations of cut and fill volumes. BDS also required a geotechnical report with recommendations for fill placement and compaction, retaining wall design and foundation and or excavation stability and shoring. This letter and report were not submitted into the record. Both BDS and BES's notifications and necessary requirements indicate the impact that development in both phases one and two will have on the open space, fragile and sensitive environmental area of the wetland and Falling Creek as a headwater to the Trang Creek watershed. Yet the evidence in the record does not include this information. Parks and open areas 33920460 requires quote, focusing on natural areas, large areas consisting mostly of vegetative landscaping or outdoor recreation community gardens or public squares, close quote. Exhibit 133 uh, referenced um, in that earlier testimony with the hearings officer, quotes the comprehensive plan, interpreting and applying language in context of land use designation for open space is intended to promote entertaining leisure within an unobstructed open space, promoting and sustaining ecological processes, supporting life systems, and maintaining the balance of species and the ecosystem, close quote. The comprehensive plan is clear that leisure entertainment must also promote and sustain ecological processes, thus supporting life systems and maintaining the balance of species and ecosystem, the ecosystem. It does not just say, define these, um, define it as sports recreation. This application does not do that. Uh, thank you very much. Next up, we have Megan Farrell. Hi, my name is Megan Farrell and I live in the West Portland Park area near Jackson Middle School. Coinciding with Exhibit 141, Exhibit 142 entails team communications regarding tennis court site development between BDS site development engineer and BES planning, development planning, which clearly identifies BES did not conduct the proper site development review prior to approval. Refer to pertinent exhibit documents 136 through 146 and 154 through 158. BDS engineer, quote, anywho, new surprise, Group McKenzie PPS has submitted an SD permit application for site grading on middle, Jackson Middle School, Southwest Corner. It's for removal of a tennis court in the Southwest Corner of the campus grounds. However, they are showing cuts along the west property line slopes and filling to the east, according to their drawings. About 3,700 cubic yards of new fill will be placed. 
it looks like fill will be placed over both the BES utility easement as well as the private storm sewer alignments. Don't we need the conditional land use review completed and approved before we start approving grading permits for the site, unquote. BES planning, quote, Oh, I'm not sure about the timing. I did talk with BES development who reviewed site development permit for the removal of the tennis courts, but he said there was no grading proposed for the southwest corner, unquote. BDS engineer, quote, yeah, there's a table on their drawing showing how much fill is to be placed. It's either 3,700 or 4,100 cubic yards, and they're showing new contour lines over the alignment areas. It looks like cutting along the west property line slopes and filling within that low area east of the same property line. Unquote. BES planning, quote, looks like James approved from BES with these notes. Grading show minimal increase approximately one foot in grade in area over existing BES sanitary main. Unquote. BDS engineer, quote, okay, sounds like BES doesn't care, but the site development and land use came in on the very same day. I'm guessing they are jumping the gun on the SD. And hopefully they don't go from one to two feet of fill to 10 feet once they have their grading permit for minor filling in hand. Smiley face emoji. I Winky face emoji? Emoji. I probably still need to check with Andrew Galicia as they are also calling out 440 cubic yards of fill to be placed within, quote, wetland areas. As I recall, filling within wetland areas requires a conditional land use review, unquote. BES planning quote, yeah, their entire goal in submitting this early was to get it in before the new environmental zone map protection code went to a, into effect on 10-1-2022. Now they are vested in the previous code, which does not have environmental zone on it. The map correction put E-zone over the wetlands. I talked to Andrew Galizia about it too, but not the planning zoning BDS reviewer for the site development permit, unquote. Thank you. Next up, we have Nicole Au. Hi, my name is Nicole Au. I live in the West Portland Park area near Jackson Middle School. Uh, this actually what I'm going to read goes with what Megan Farrell just read exhibit. This is exhibit 141, which goes with exhibit 142. Uh, testimony exhibit 141 entails internal communication regarding associated tennis court site development between BES development review team and BES development planning. The required site review is not conducted prior to BES approval. The following communications were received through a public records request. Email subject, Jackson Middle School Tennis Court Demo, September 28, 2022. Review staff, quote, Hi, I read your EA comments regarding the private storm sewer that crosses this lot and the potential for a wetland designation. I am not sure if I have reason to hold them up on this demo permit. It would make sense to me if there was development on this permit that would be impacting the drainage area, but I can't complete the argument for calling out a drainage reserve when the scope of work in this case will be restoring the site closer to a pre-developed condition. I reviewed the grading plan and section and they are doing two minor things. One, minimally increasing the grade over BES sanitary main by approximately one foot, not a typical concern for BES maintenance engineering. And two, adding a catch basin in the area of demolished courts to drain the reseeded natural area to the existing private storm sewer. I am curious to see what is being discussed and make sure that we don't have a reason to cite this permit for more submittal requirements. Let me know what you think." Unquote. From planning staff, quote, Hi, there are a couple of layers to this situation. The E-Zone correction map goes into effect on 10 one which will put an environmental protection zone overlay on that wetland. If PPS gets their SD permit in before 10-1, they could potentially fill the wetland and apply later to remove the protection overlay. So I think that is why we are seeing this SD permit now. If the SD permit involves filling the wetland, then DSL should be involved, but that is up to the BDS planner to recognize. Here's what I know about the storm pipe. We TV'd it not too long ago and found that it is in major disrepair. If I was PPS, I would definitely want to check that there is no risk for sinkholes or anything before placing new fields over the top where kids are playing. 
And it seems like it would also be in their best interest to investigate this before grading or operating any heavy machinery over the pipe, because the pipe is not in good condition and poses a risk. But I didn't get the feeling that PPS fully grasps it's their responsibility. My EA notes were to emphasize the current state of the pipe and its potential risk, and hope they are taking that into account as they plan their project." Unquote. Thank you. Next up, we have Leah Peterson. Hello, my name is Leah Peterson, and I grew up next to Jackson Middle School. The BES and BDS communications are of major concern regarding the conditional use master plan approval. Fallen Creek is on EPA's impaired waters list, and PPS phase two is dependent upon the tennis court site development permit to fill and grade the wetland and drainage reserve. Exhibits in the record indicate that phase two will lead to the development of three new sports fields that do not currently exist, as well as two new tennis courts. This is not restoring the site closer to a pre-developed condition, nor is it reseeding and increasing the grade by just one foot over the sanitary sewer. In fact, more fill is proposed. Exhibits 154 through 158 outline filling more than one to two feet of the wetland area. The revised stormwater report, Exhibit A21, outlines the development of the synthetic turf fields for Phase 2, adding an additional 3.5 acres of artificial surfaces that will drain into the stormwater, discharging microplastics into Fallen Creek. PPS claims the tennis court site development will remove tennis courts and do associated grading and receding of slopes. In fact, the Phase 2 proposal is to fill the wetland to build two new tennis courts and install three new synthetic turf sports fields. BDS notes concern regarding the timing of the site development permit and this land use review, and for the proper review not being completed before an approval. BES and BDS issued critical submittal requirements on 10-10-22, requiring PPS to submit dewatering plans, on-site contamination reports, erosion sediment pollution, pollutant control plans, and to clarify fill quantities. However, BES had already approved the site development and PPS never provided the required reports. In Exhibit A12, Halley Consulting states, if cut or fill slopes greater than four feet in height are planned, Pali Consulting should be contacted for additional geotechnical evaluation. Cut and fill slopes should be planted with appropriate vegetation to provide protection against erosion. PPS Phase 2 intends to construct artificial surfaces, placing tennis courts and three new synthetic turf sports fields in cut and fill slopes, not vegetation. Thank you. Next up, we have Teresa Peterson. Hi, my name is Teresa Peterson, homeowner, and Falling Creek goes along two sides of my property. Grading the slope topography in phase two and filling the wetland and drainage reserve will dramatically alter the ecological functioning of the natural environment, producing significant detrimental environmental impacts that will also compromise and risk the collapse and failure of the Falling Creek stormwater pipe, impacting upstream and downstream neighborhood properties, as well as the Falling Creek headwaters contribution to the Tryon Creek watershed. The tennis court phase two development will cause this significant detrimental impact due to the grading and destruction of the wetlands that serve a vital part in the watershed. Staff identified their concerns in their internal communications that you heard, emphasizing the potential risk for sinkholes. The site development permit should have been required to be listed in the conditional use master plan. 
Polly consulted. Consulting indicates, based on information from McKenzie PPS, we estimate that grading for the site will be limited to cuts and fills of less than four feet. The existing culvert, referring to Falling Creek, should also be evaluated. The evaluation should include videotaping the line for its full length. Areas of damage or that are in poor condition should be repaired prior to further grading, prior to further grading or placement of structural fill. Based on this documentation and the evidence in the record, if the application is approved, there should be a condition of approval requiring a maximum of one foot of fill to be allowed over the sanitary and stormwater pipes and no more than four feet of fill on any area of the site. The hearings office erred by not enforcing 33-262-100C documentation in advance, which would have required expert evaluation and explanation certified by a registered engineer that the proposed activity can achieve the offsite impact standards in question. Thank you. We have Bill Dent. Bill, you're muted. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hey, Bill. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and council members for taking the time to hear from us today. My name is Bill Dant. The application is missing key information. Conditional use approval criteria 33-820-70D components of a master plan stipulates the site plan must meet the application requirements in 33-730-60C and must include all improvements planned in conjunction with the proposed use. Part J, other discretionary reviews stipulate when design review or other required reviews are also being requested, the master plan must specifically state which phases or proposals the reviews apply to. The plan must explain and provide enough detail on how the proposals comply with the approval criteria for the review. Application requirements, the applicant is responsible for the accuracy of all information submitted. A complete application for all landers view all land use reviews consist of all the materials listed, and the applicant is required to submit a written statement that includes the following items. A complete list of all land use reviews requested, a complete description of the proposal, including existing and proposed changes or uses to the site, a description of how all approval criteria for the land use reviews are met, additional information needed to understand the proposal or requested at the pre-application conference, the tennis court site development permit is pertinent to the phase two development and will significantly alter the entire ecological functioning of the wetland and drainage reserve. Not only does this place the Falling Creek stormwater pipe at risk for collapse and failure, impacting upstream and downstream properties, but it will also devastate the sensitive Falling Creek ecosystem by conveying and discharging synthetic turf wastewater into the EPA listed impaired headwater of Tryon Creek watershed. It should have been included in the conditional use master plan. PPS failed to submit a complete list of all land use reviews requested, omitting the tennis court site development permit, which phase two is dependent upon, while adamantly denying its relevance during the conditional use master plan hearing when it was brought up. PPS further ignored providing full and accurate descriptions, failed to substantially address all approval criteria for the land use and failed to submit required reports and data when notified and instructed to do so. So pursuant to 33-730-60 application requirements, PPS's conditional use master plan application should be considered incomplete and the land use review denied. Thank you for listening. Next up, we have Kathy Fetty. My name is Kathy Fetty, and this is my first time testifying anywhere except the previous hearing. And thank you for listening. 
Um, one of the hearing findings was in the decision letter was that the Southwest Portland Community Plan applied to the PPS conditional use master plan. Um, I note that in the PPS presentation today, there's a slide that shows the Southwest Portland Community Plan, but one slide isn't what the intent was. According to the general rules for administration enforcement of land use, um, the community plan should take precedence for and be accounted for early in the process of, of a plan like the Jackson Middle site. site. Um, this is per 33.700.070E. Um, I'm an engineer, not a lawyer. Um, but my understanding means that the Southwest community plan should be um, paid attention to and the context and the development of this open space should, should take into account the community that's going to reside in. The Jackson site plan and the land use decision then airs by adopting the BDS report in its entirety and enables Portland Public Schools to avoid defining how phase two will be consistent with the Southwest Community Plan for open parks, recreation, and open space, as well as watershed concerns. And then further says that the, the property doesn't really count as a significant wildlife habitat, environment, or scenic site. PPS then finally claims that Falling Creek, a year-round waterway, is a storm drain. This ignores the relationship of the JMS site to Tryon Creek watershed and the impact of the proposed development on the downstream state park. Um, BDS identifies Fallen Creek as a highly sensitive, significant resource and value as a headwater to Tryon Creek. I raised kids in the Portland school districts. I know we need better school playing fields. I would prefer them to be artificial, or not be artificial, but rather be natural turf. It fits the direction our entire world is headed. And I would like PPS proposal to respect our community efforts to protect our stream, to provide open access for all uses of the school property and to enhance the overall natural habitat. I think appropriate compromise is in order and I would like the council to consider a middle ground. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate this very much. Next up, we have Peter Limbaugh. Hello, my name is Peter Limbaugh and I live adjacent to the Jackson Middle School. Concerning Falling Creek and Tyron Creek water quality, BES exhibits E-1 and G-2 inform PPS the storm sewer contains the flow of Falling Creek running across the subject property. BES has discovered significant structural issues with the storm pipe in very poor condition. BES recommends a robust analysis of the pipe condition to identify how proposed grading and future development will impact the structural integrity of the pipe and highly recommends PPS consider potential risk associated with the pipe prior to construction to confirm that the pipe will continue to convey upstream flow. The evidence does not contain this analysis. BDS Exhibit G-2 requires PPS to address approval criterion 33.815.100.A, uses in open space. This will require a discussion of environmental resources and water quality, even though the project is vested against the new environmental zones map. And further advising PPS to, quote, discuss compliance with Oregon Division of State Lands requirements for wetlands. Considering phase two in the tennis court site development, the application does not provide the wetland investigation or the, uh, or the of Division of State Lands determination. Where, where the Division of State Lands notified as required. Statute requires state lands to be notified within five days of submitting permit request. Regarding, regarding stormwater design, Exhibit E-1 alerts PPS, quote, DES has concerns about the weight of rocks over the existing sanitary sewer main, unquote. Neighbors ask, what about the concerns of the weight of rock over the stormwater pipe? The evidence does not assess the impact of rock or fill on the stormwater pipe. 
As outlined in Exhibits 202, 235, and 249, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, along with a growing body of research, substantiate the long-term harmful effects and toxicity of microplastic pollutants in soil, waterways, and the air. This research notes how microplastics act a lot like crumb rubber as they're made from the same crude oil and petroleum-based byproducts, all of which are harmful pollutants to the environment when discharged into stormwater and waterways for wildlife and aquatic organisms, as well as human exposure. Filtering, filtering the microtoxic pollutants is nearly impossible, as well as posing problems for the effectiveness, effectiveness of stormwater designs becoming clogged by microparticles and the accumulate bacteria transmitted into soil and water and onto aquatic organisms which bioaccumulate. Compliance with the stormwater management manual will not ensure no increase in this pollutant. Thank you for your time. Next up, we have Gary Rundy. Hello, can you hear me? My, Loud, my name you sound good. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my name is Gary Rundy, longtime resident of West Portland Park. <clears throat> the application fails to comply with the required standards of 17.38 drainage and water quality and 17.39.040 prohibited discharges number four and 10 regarding heat and sediments. Developing eight acres of synthetic turf increases eight acres of artificial surfaces introducing pollution to the watershed. Discharging synthetic turf wastewater laden with microplastics derived from crude oil and petroleum byproducts into Falling Creek con constitutes discharging heat and sediment pollutants. The adopted comprehensive plan calls out the urban heat island effect defined by a measurable increase in ambient urban air temperatures resulting primarily from the replacement of vegetation and other heat absorbing infrastructure, which result in significant temperature differences. Evidence in the record documents the heat impacts of artificial turf. Furthermore, the Southwest Community Plan's watershed mandates are to Quote, prevent any net degradation of water quality, aquatic and streamside plant and animal habitats and ecosystems, channel stability or watershed health to minimize risk to public safety, private property and public infrastructure and to reduce the volume, velocity and pollutant load of stormwater runoff entering systems, unquote. Southwest Community Plan's core values are to, quote, to maintain water quality and quantity, aquatic and streamside plant and animal habitats and ecosystems, soil, stream, and slope stability, and scenic educational and recreational values of Southwest Portland's natural areas and streams, end quote. The application fails to demonstrate compliance with the Comprehensive Plan and Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policies. Thank you for my, for my time. That's it. All right, uh, next up we have Rochelle Steinberg. That's seeing. Oh, wait, here we go. On mute, sorry. <laughs> Let me, let's try that again. My name is Rochelle Steinberg and I am a homeowner adjacent to Jackson Middle School. The evidence does not contain the required water quality and hydrology calculations for phase two in the revised stormwater report. PPS also omitted accurate cut and fill calculations and quantities concerning both sanitary sewer and Falling Creek stormwater pipes. Without water quality reports, how can the wastewater design demonstrate pre and post pollutant re reduction to meet criteria for TMDLs in wastewater runoff into Falling Creek? 
Without a water quality report, what is the stream quality? Without phase two hydrology reports, how can the volume of control, flow control be determined? Phase two topography and wetland and drainage reserve are completely different from phase one and cannot rely on phase one calculations. Discrepancies between cut and fill quantities in different submittals could result in structural damage of the stormwater pipe conveying fall Falling Creek under the site. These issues, could produce significant adverse impacts, exacerbating and increasing current flooding of adjacent properties. The hazardous impacts of synthetic turf microplastics on the watershed, as well as the poor condition of the Falling Creek stormwater pipe and its capacity to sustain surcharge loads of phase two construction without collapse are safety issues. The proposal will cause increased risk for flooding to upstream and or downstream adjacent properties, as well as devastating disturbance to the earth and sloped topography, raising concerns about site stability. The hearings officer erred by permitting PPS to ignore the full scope of 33-815-100-C2, stipulating that proposals will not have significant adverse impacts on the livability of nearby residential zoned lands due to safety issues, as well as failing to submit the required signed statement from an engineer certifying that all offsite impact standards in 33-262-100 can be met. Thank you. Next up, we have Kabora Andron. Kebra. Hi, my name is Kebra Andron, and I am a longtime neighbor to JMS site. PPS does not meet the required burden of proof to demonstrate they have met all the applicable criteria. Code requires addressing issues that will impose significant impacts on the surrounding area and environment, and I please ask Council to review the video exhibit introduced into the record for an accurate view of the site characteristics of Phase 2 and the wetland topography to really appreciate the fragile and sensitive environment that is here that BDS photos actually distort and fail to show. Evidence introduced into the record demonstrates the overwhelming discrepancies within Portland Public Schools conditional land use application and their tennis court site development plans to develop the wetland and drainage reserve. Both phase one and phase two with the associated tennis court site development clearly pose significant impacts to Falling Creek adjacent properties and Tryon Creek watershed. The hearings officer has erred, allowing PPS to narrowly focus only on open, open space outdoor recreation for a small group of youth to, who play sports at the expense of others and the natural environment. PPS exhibit A18 claims, quote, the facilities at the Jackson School site serve a predominantly local population of students and families, and the proposal will allow improvements to enhance its ability to serve the primary group of users, unquote. This is a misrepresentation of primary users regarding desired character and primary purpose of open space to access the JMS natural area for outdoor recreation. PPS applies a very narrow perspective of who characterizes the primary group of users. Adjacent homeowners and fellow West Park neighbors are a diverse community of predominantly retired seniors and a prominent hockey community that frequent the JMS site daily to walk and enjoy the natural environment who are in the proximity of safety and offsite impacts as well. The hearings officer errs by not applying comprehensive plan 3G and 3.4 to enhance habitat, preserve natural resources and ecosystems and direct built environments provide safe, healthful and attractive environment for people of all ages and abilities. Plan goal five dictates, um, state planning goal five dictates local plant governments will protect natural resources and open space resources for present and future generations. Goal eight defines open space recreation as protected natural environment, land retained in a substantially natural condition. Neighbors that we gather today to speak to criteria to defend our open space as if our lives depend on it, because our lives depend on it. Please deny PPS's land use development. PPS does not even meet the city's climate change endeavors. I thank you for your time and your consideration. Next up, we have Sharon Keith. 
My name is Sharon Keast. This testimony is in my capacity as a Triumph Creek Watershed Council board member, not as a City of Portland employee. This application must be denied for not meeting the approval criteria of Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policy Objective 1C, reduce the volume, velocity, and pollutant load of stormwater runoff entering streams. The proposed filtration system does not remove per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS, known as forever chemicals, found in artificial turf that have been linked to environmental health issues. The manufacturer advises that the solution is to remove these products from the consumer supply chain and ensure that they never make their way to the aquatic environment to begin with. The current poor condition of the Jackson Middle School athletic fields is due to lack of maintenance. The same disregard for maintenance of a filtration system is a reasonable expectation. The manufacturer admits the dismal track record with maintenance of their filtration systems is a problem and that the vast majority of their installed stormwater filtration systems are in various states of neglect and in need of maintenance. When they're not properly maintained, runoff that is intended to be treated is bypassed downstream directly into receiving waters. In October 2023, Portland City Council approved an ordinance to authorize application to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for a $20 million grant as a partner in a $50 million project intended to bring salmon into the watershed where a high quality spawning and rearing habitat exists. This follows the city's $8.8 .8 million investment to eliminate a fish passage barrier under Southwest Boone's Ferry Road. This proposal would diminish the current high quality salmon habitat and is contrary to those investments. The hearings officer failed to consider the Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policy Objective 1C, the inability of the proposed filtration system to filter known PFAS pollution associated with artificial turf, and lack of a plan to maintain the filtration system to ensure it filters anything. Thank you. Next up, we have Marianne Fitzgerald. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Marianne Fitzgerald, and I'm the president of Crestwood Neighborhood Association, which is within the Jackson Middle School attendance area. Our neighborhood children use the Jackson Middle School facilities. We strongly support the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association's appeal and urge you to grant the appeal and overturn the hearings officer's uh, approval of the conditional use master plan for the following reasons. You've already heard a lot of testimony um, about the many negative impacts associated with the use of synthetic turf on athletic fields and how the Portland Public Schools proposal fails to meet the approval criteria in code and, in code, and we strongly agree. Falling Creek is a tributary near the headwaters of Fano Creek, of uh, Tryon Creek, and Tryon Creek's watershed health today is considered low. The proposal uh, will not improve water quality and it's very likely to make it worse. Uh, there's a few other issues that haven't been raised yet uh, that we addressed in our written testimony previously, um, including uh, parking and access to the fields and bathrooms. Um, the hearings officer decided that a parking lot five blocks away, um, you know, the fields are near Southwest 40th and the, um, the parking lots near Southwest 35th is okay for little kids, grandmas and families to get from the parking lot to the athletic fields. Um, PBOT's condition of approval requires a walkway, but that should be modified so that it includes bicycle facilities or a multi-use path and bike parking near the athletic fields to better improve access um, rather than requiring people to drive a car and park on the street like they do today. Um, we also note that the, the proposal um, includes a sewer pipe, but no proposal for bathrooms. We don't want these little kids peeing in the fields. We want them to have a Portland Loo or some other facility on site that will support the expanded use of these fields. We want you to take a closer look at how the city of Portland can better support recreational facilities, open space, and environmental protection through the land use process. These are not mutually exclusive. 
Portland Public Schools should use this opportunity to teach our children how we can better protect the environment, the climate, and natural resources as part of new development in Portland. We urge you to grant the appeal and overturn the hearings officer approval of the conditional use plan. This is not about whether we need fields. This is about whether the plan supports the health of our children and the environment. You, the members of the Portland City Council, must do your part to protect the planet while supporting new development in the future. Thank you. Next up, we have Amanda Fritz. Uh, good afternoon, Council. I'm Amanda Fritz, testifying for myself. I support improving sports facilities at the school. The approval criteria require that the renovations must not be at the expense of watershed health, site safety, or public access to the grounds. The application fails to meet the Southwest Community Plan watershed policies. Trying Creek is a listed watershed with federally mandated protections. Commissioner Fritz, could I could I get you to stop for one moment? Lindley, go ahead. And I apologize, former Commissioner Fritz, but what I, I had heard that you were going to be identified as the person providing rebuttal it, as, as the appellant. And I wanted to make sure because um, you can't be in both roles as an appellant and as a supporter of the appellant because that would require us to provide additional time to the applicant. So I wanted to make sure before you before you gave this testimony that you were not planning to give the rebuttal presentation. I apologize, I didn't know that. Um, I am planning to do the rebuttal and so I'll combine my testimony with the neighborhood association. Sorry about that. Okay, Th thank you, Lindley. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, appreciate it. And so we'll, we'll hear from you in a few minutes. Thank you. Next up, we have Terry Prig Rigsby. Hey, uh, good afternoon. My name is Terry Prig Rigsby, and I am a parent, a Portland Public School parent. Um, Jackson Middle School is our neighborhood middle school, and uh, my son is an athlete. So um, I am in favor of um, making improvements to our sports facilities here in West Portland. Um, however, I am um, I work with the East African immigrant and refugee community here in West Portland Park, and um, I would like to speak about the uh, heat island effects and um, what I consider to be a lack of equity in uh, decision making here for this plan. Uh, the Jackson Middle School property is within the West Portland Town Center. Um, plan, which was adopted by you, uh, City Council, last year in 2023. And that plan centers the voices of communities most affected by the combined impacts of environmental inequities, climate change, and systemic racism. And I believe that the current plan does not um, apply an equity lens when considering the environmental and climate change impacts and actually makes these impacts worse by removing pervious uh, grass and replacing that with acres of um, plastic. Um, and the addition of this artificial turf uh, will create new heat islands in an area where um, city of Portland itself has identified this area as um, where residents have a um, shorter life expectancy than other parts of Portland due to the um, effects of poor air quality um, from the, its proximity to I-5 and the Barber Boulevard corridor. So um, adding uh, several acres of plastics that are going to be off-gassing is really just making it worse for some of our most vulnerable communities. Um, and artificial turf fields um, will not only make the air quality worse, but will make it hotter. We'll be creating new heat islands, uh, which is something that we all know we are trying to avoid in the city of Portland. And with record heats um, in summers in the past, um, you know, adding this much turf could um, result in temperatures of like 95 to 140 degrees um, above artificial turf fields. And um, that's just something that is unacceptable. <clears throat> so uh, I believe that this is not a zero sum decision. You know, we can and have, um, we can and we should have sports facilities that do not cause harmful human and environmental impacts. Um, we don't want to create new heat islands. We don't want to create more inequity and um, inequitable health outcomes for our underserved and underrepresented communities. And uh, we don't want to harm the watershed and the ecosystems that are here in West Portland. So uh, what we do want are healthy spaces for our children to recreate. And we absolutely can achieve that through a better plan and something that is in concert with the city's um, urban sustainability goals. So thank you. 
Quincy Bowman. Hi, my name is Quincy Bowman and I'm a member of the Tran Creek Watershed Council and I've lived in the, this area of Southwest Portland for the last four years. Um, Falling Creek is a headwater tributary to healthy steelhead and salmon habitats and populations. The sewer pipe and the stormwater pipe that conveys Falling Creek run parallel to one another across the project. If the project is approved, the sewer pipe would be corrected, so the following point could be put as two birds with one stone. While evacuation, well, well, excavation, apologies, is occurring, Public uh, Portland Public Schools should address the pipe conveying Falling Creek as well. The project would add untold amounts of weight and cubic feet of rock on top of a pipe that's fractured throughout. With heavy, layered, and rigid artificial turf installed, the likelihood of any future corrective action to the pipe would be diminished substantially, if not entirely eliminated. In short, this would be the only opportunity to fix the pipe conveying Falling Creek if this project is approved. Multiple BS statements state that the pipe overall is in bad shape. I quote, uh, please note this pipe is in very poor condition, end quote, from BS exhibit E1 and E2. And another quote from BS, through condition investigations, BS has discovered significant structural issues with the storm pipe, um, end quote, exhibit G2. Um, according to the application, applicant's own consultant, uh, Polly Consulting, they quote, Areas of damage or that are in poor condition should be repaired prior to further grading or placement of structural fill, end quote. And that's from exhibit A12. Thus, per the applicant's own consultant and BES information, the entirety of the pipe needs to be repaired. A potential method to improve degraded pipes called slip lining would improve the structural integrity of the pipe, but reduce its capacity to convey Falling Creek's flows running counter to the Southwest Community Plan's watershed objective 1D. In conclusion, the absence of addressing these improvements to the pipe conveying Falling Creek is counter to the Southwest Community Plan's watershed policy to reduce pollutants and protect the integrity of the surrounding watershed wildlife populations. If the project is approved, the conditional use of the full replacement of the Falling Creek pipe is essential. That said, the appeal should be accepted. Thank you. Next up, we have Eric Taxer. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Taxer um, with the Tryon Creek Watershed Council. I have 30 years of environmental engineering experience doing um, environmental enforcement, regulatory work specifically related to stormwater runoff and Clean Water Act compliance. I want to talk about the integrity of the pipe conveying Falling Creek in the context of the impervious surfaces. Where formerly rain in Portland would fall on trees and absorb into soils, now more rainwater falls on impervious surfaces like roofs, roads, and parking lots and becomes stormwater runoff flowing through infrastructure and into the creeks. Due to more impervious surfaces, it's characteristic for urban streams to be flashy during storms, meaning a larger volume of stormwater flows carry more pollutants into infrastructure than creeks more quickly as compared to an undisturbed watershed. The pipe that was long ago installed to convey Falling Creek across a former dairy farm is inherently likely to be insufficient to convey today's water flow. Neighbors' testimony in the record attest to the longstanding flooding issues up and downstream of the campus. When we say we only need to avoid net degradation, for a system that's already degraded or functioning poorly perpetuates existing inadequacies. The hearings officer erred in relying too heavily on the stormwater management manual when it doesn't meet the policies of the Southwest Community Plan, with which are required approval criteria, especially with respect to water quality and habitat concerns, not just flow issues as noted in the staff presentation this afternoon. The issues regarding the pipe conveying Falling Creek will only worsen over time. If it is left untouched in its known state of disrepair, then the habitat characteristics listed in the Southwest Community Plan Watershed Policy Objective 1 are jeopardized and the project will not meet the policy. Attempting to fix the pipe through slip lining would decrease the total capacity of the pipe to convey water due to the loss of its internal diameter. This thumb over the hose pipe effect would increase the velocity, exacerbating already documented downstream erosion concerns. The project would not meet the Community Plan Watershed Policy Objective 1. This project 
would likely affect the already failing pipe and lead to adverse watershed impacts, and the policy is not met. The only acceptable condition regarding the pipe conveying Falling Creek would be to replace it entirely. With respect to comments that have already been submitted in support of the project, um, I'd like to note that the, the testimony actually references approval criteria. For this. The, uh, the valid established need for improvements to the athletic fields is not reason enough to bypass necessary environmental protections, especially in this era of climate change. We don't think these pa parents are bad actors. We think they've been presented with information that's compelling in support of the project, but probably not comprehensive with respect to environmental impacts. Thank you. Mayor, that completes. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, and just to let everybody know, when we are done hearing the next group of public testifiers on behalf of the applicant, uh, legal counsel is diligently jotting down what is new evidence. And so we'll we'll be hearing from legal counsel at the end of that. Uh, so thank you, everybody who just testified. We appreciate your thoughtful testimony. Now the applicant has 15 minutes to present under the rules. Welcome to representatives of the Portland Public School District. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and the rest of the city council. I'm gonna let uh, the PowerPoint load. So Mackenzie is going to share screen and load up the PowerPoint and then we'll begin. Thanks. Hey, Christy, could you identify yeah. yourself for the record? Yeah. We all know who you are, but- uh, Thank you. For the record, thanks. Sure, and thanks, Susanna. This is Christy White. I'm a land use attorney with Radler White Parks and Alexander representing Portland Public Schools. With me is Heidi Bertman from PPS who will offer some context for this proposal and then I will respond to the claims on appeal. So we'll advance slide and hand it to you, Heidi. Thanks so much, Christy. Is everybody, is my audio okay? A thumbs up, thank you so much. My name is Heidi Bertman. I am the Senior Program Manager for Planning for Portland Public Schools. PPS thanks City Council and Mayor Wheeler for your time and attention to this important matter. And we thank staff for your detailed and thorough presentation. Quick note, um, attendance at 2 p.m. on a school day schedule can be challenging, but please be assured that there is wide support in the PPS community for this plan. The PPS vision states, quote, High quality, free public education has historically been the foundation of this nation's political, social, and economic dynamism, and it will continue to be in the future. The intent, oh, end quote, excuse me, the intent of our planning standards is to provide equitable distribution of facility programming in support of the PPS graduate portrait for all students in the district. The background of this project is found in our planning standards. The Jackson Fields improvements are identified in the Long Range Facilities Plan, which was accepted by the PPS Board of Education in December of 2021. That was an update to the previous plan, which was issued in 2012. In the Long Range Facility Plan, or LRFP, all program support and capacity needs, including fields, were studied in the context of projected enrollment through 2036. The LRFP was developed through a robust engagement process, which included students and affinity groups in close coordination with district teachers. The final recommendations in the LRFP were developed in collaboration with those representatives, district academic program leaders, and the Critical Race Theory or CRIT Coalition through an intensive series of written surveys, interviews, and group dialogue sessions. The LRFP is one of two primary facility planning documents at PPS. The other is the PPS Education Specifications, or EDSPEC. This is the planning guide for educational facilities approved by the PPS Board of Education. It provides guidance on the standard facilities needed for programs at each school. The high school EDSPEC identifies program support requirements for a comprehensive high school, including the number and types of sports fields. The administration of high school fields assumes that they will support high school PE and athletics, as well as youth athletic programs. The middle school EDSPEC identifies field space for each middle school to support PE and youth athletic programs. The combined field count based on the EDSPEC requirements for the two PPS Westside High Schools, Lincoln and Ida B. Wells, 
is short a total of one field per sport for soccer, baseball, and softball, as well as two tennis courts. Since high schools are assumed to provide essential field program support, this deficit impacts a broad cross-section of our community with increased travel distances, time, and costs to access facilities outside the PPS system. Taking into account both middle and high schools, the current and future needs for student athletics, scheduling exceeds PPS capacity across the district. To address this, the LRFP identified three PPS sites for athletic field improvements to relieve the challenges, Jackson, Whitaker, and Marshall. Of the three sites, Jackson Middle School was identified as the first site for improvements as it has organized fields and would not require replanning. The remaining two sites will be planned for improvements in the near future in coordination with other PPS program support needs. Thanks. Back to you, Christy. Thank you. Um, if we can advance the slide, I'd start with an orientation of the site. So this is a 35 acre site. Of the 35 acres, a maximum of seven acres will be resurfaced with turf fields. That means that 80% of the site will not have a turf component. Therefore, city staff and the hearings officers' findings that most of the site will remain as is are completely accurate. As you can see from this slide, the turf fields will be surrounded by grass and the entire infield of the track will remain grass. Second, under the current zoning, this site could be developed with 50% building coverage. This plan calls for a maximum building coverage of only 11.4% which minimizes impervious surface and stormwater runoff and enhances recreational opportunities in the area of a city that you now heard is running a significant deficit in these kinds of fields. Next slide, please. The appellant's claims focus on environmental resources and the stormwater management plan. Taking the environmental zoning first, this slide shows the applicable environmental zoning on the site. Under PCC 337080A, this is the only environmental zoning that applies to this proposal. And as you can see, there is a small area of EC zoning in the northern border of the site outlined in blue. This air, entire area will be untouched and undisturbed. There is no environmental zoning over any area of the underground pipe carrying Falling Creek. Next slide. There are two approval criteria related to the appellant's claims. The first is PCC 338-15-100-B3, which states, quote, public services for water supply, police, and fire protection are capable of serving the proposed use, and proposed sanitary waste disposal and stormwater disposal are acceptable to BES. BES regulates stormwater through the Stormwater Management Manual, or SWIM, and the Source Control Manual. Exhibit H240 at pages 11 to 12 describe the purpose of the SWIM. The purpose of the SWIM is to respond to several regulatory mandates, including the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, and DEQ requirements by, quote, providing stormwater management principles and techniques that help mimic the natural hydrologic cycle and improve water quality. Specifically, the purpose of the SWIM requirements on a project basis is to, quote, protect both watershed resources and infrastructure investments as each project subject to the SWIM meets the requirements of this manual, it will contribute to achieving these important citywide goals, end quote. So do we meet the requirements of the manual and therefore contribute to responsible stormwater management in the watershed? The answer is yes. We submitted a stormwater management report and despite claims to the contrary, also a geotechnical report. The city reviewed the report under the above criteria and found that our proposed discharge to the storm sewer will meet the swim requirements through a variety of means, including under drains and rock storage conveyed to a flow control manual manhole, followed by water quality cartridge filters with flow through planters sized to meet swim requirements. Importantly here, table 1-4 of the swim also contains specific requirements for the Tryon Creek watershed, and we are required by the SWIM and our conditions of approval to also meet those Tryon Creek specific TMDLs, as you've heard from appellant testimony. A TMDL is a calculation of the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water body can accept and still meet the water quality standards for public health and healthy ecosystems. A full description of this system can be referenced in our October 27th final legal argument to the hearings officer. 
But with this analysis and the stormwater report and the geotechnical report, the city easily found under 338151 b 3 that the stormwater system is capable of serving the use and is acceptable to BES under the adopted SWIM. There is no stormwater evaluation of this specific proposal in the record that refutes or undermines this conclusion. None at all. Next slide, please. Second, as addressed by the hearings officer, there are several policies of the Southwest Community Plan that encourage the development of more recreational opportunities and responsible stormwater management. The approval criteria requires that the application is, quote, consistent with these policies. In previous land use cases, council has interpreted consistent with to mean in harmony with and does not contradict the purpose of. There are many policies, but two are most relevant, as you've heard, to the appellant's claims, and these are the watershed policy and the parks, rec, and open space policy. The parks policy calls for creating new parks and open spaces to meet current and future needs and to enhance existing opportunities to serve current and future residents. There's really no contest here that these fields are badly needed to serve both current and future need and that the turf fields will extend playtime deeper into the season and for more hours of the day. The project therefore is in harmony with and doesn't contradict the parks policy. The watershed policies call for, quote, managing stormwater on a watershed basis to prevent, as you've heard, net degradation of water quality, watershed health, minimize risk to public safety, reduce stormwater runoff, and improve dry season flows. These are the same purposes of the stormwater management manual. Recall that the purpose of the swim is to, quote, protect watershed resources and, quote, mimic the natural hydrologic cycle and, quote, improve water quality and the swim amongst other things, also has specific regulations for the Tryon Creek watershed. These purposes are accomplished by project compliance with the SWIM requirements. Specifically now, and to get into the details, this proposal will restrict the post-development peak runoff rates to their pre-development rates for half of the two-year storm plus the 5, 10, and 25-year storm. The rock underneath the turf will operate as flow control storage, the control manhole will be installed to further manage flow control. Perforated pipe will be installed at the bottom of the storage trench so it will completely drain. A filter vault with filter cartridges will also be utilized to protect water quality reaching 90% for total suspended solids as required by the SWIM. And the proposal must comply with the TDML requirements specific to Tryon Creek watershed. With these measures, we are certainly in harmony with and don't contradict the purpose of the watershed policies of the Southwest Community Plan. And as for trees on this slide, um, this hasn't been mentioned too much, but we are planting 163 trees, which will add over two acres of new tree canopy. This tree canopy will create more shade, habitat, and filtration on the site, also contributing positively to the stormwater management and the environmental benefits of the proposal. I wanna wrap up this section on the next slide with a reminder that we have several conditions of approval related to stormwater management on the next slide, including proof of swim compliance with each project proposal, including TMDLs for the Triangle Creek watershed and a prohibition on the use of crumb rubber on these fields. Next slide, please. The remainder of these slides uh, were, not, were uh, not raised specifically as appeal issues, but I just wanted to share them with you because the site has been carefully planned. There is a, next slide please, a trail that will be extended through the site and uh, contrary to the testimony, open to the public. It will not be gated or fenced. If fencing is used here, it will be internal to the site and not along the perimeter. I'm gonna skip over field lighting which is slides nine, 10, and 11, because we clearly meet all of the standards for field lighting, and it hasn't been argued here as an appeal issue. And PBOT's concurrence that we certainly have an ample parking supply that will handle all demand. And there was a conversation about how far this parking supply was from the fields. It is on site and is connected directly to the fields uh, through that trail. I wanna quickly um, rebut a few matters. There is great concern about the uh, condition of the creek conveyance pipe. We actually offered a condition of approval in our October 20, 
uh, memorandum to the hearings officer and are willing to add that condition here. And that condition said that the applicant is required to evaluate the condition of the creek conveyance pipe that runs across the subject property to support the proposed development, including an evaluation of the field substrates and the impact of those substrates on the structural integrity of the pipe. Prior to issuance of the first permit for conditional use master plan, the applicant must obtain BES approval for any necessary work on the pipe as a result of the proposed development. I mentioned that here again because it was rejected early on because this is a private pipe. We're quite willing to propose that condition of approval and assure everybody that that pipe will be fully evaluated in the future action. I also want to mention here that there will be portable potties added to the site for people who have to use the restroom. Obviously, for safety reasons, um, the public can't be allowed to um, come into the school building um, and in off hours or even during hours without maintenance. So we have the portable um, potties in, in that regard. Um, lastly, there has been some testimony about adding conditions of approval. No additional conditions of approval aside from the one I just mentioned are required because they're not mandated by any of the applicable approval standards and don't achieve any more than we are already achieving by compliance with the SWIM and the source control manual. They also impose unnecessary costs on the applicant who cannot bear those costs in this proposal. Um, one additional issue that I think is important here, and that is that this is a conditional use master plan. So at this stage of this proceeding, we have to demonstrate with a stormwater report that we are capable of serving our stormwater. As each field comes in for review, it will then be reviewed against the stormwater management manual that's in effect at that time and again have to prove compliance with the SWIM, which is the city's most rigorous standard for stormwater management in the city of Portland. Thank you. Well, that, uh, that may be the best timed presentation <laughs> in a long time, Christy. So thank you for that. I got lucky. <laughs> All right. So, um, Next, we will hear testimony from supporters of the applicant. So those are people who generally agree with what you just heard presented. Keelan, how many testifiers do we have in support of the applicant signed up? We have five people signed up. All right, very good. And again, three minutes each. Please state your name for the record. First up, we have Michael Nolan. Uh, greetings, everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Nolan, and I serve as the athletic director here at Ida B. Wells High School. I've been a member of this community for the past 23 years, serving as a teacher, coach, and now athletic director. We had two children graduate from IBW. We now have a freshman. All three were and are student athletes and spent many a day at Jackson Middle School running around the campus. The investment of this project is vital to our community. It will provide opportunities that are not accessible with the current conditions of the site. For example, our JV Frosh and baseball programs who traditionally use the site and field for practice and games, they don't get access because it's not playable until late April or early May. That puts stress on other facilities and puts our program at a competitive disadvantage. We have spent countless hours and dollars to improve the site, but to no avail. This is also an investment for future generations. Uh, it has been proven that athletics is a vehicle for greater attendance, better grades, and enhances student athletes' overall school experience. This project will go a long way in supporting that vision. It is vital to provide safe and equitable access for our kids and student athletes. We have limited resources in our community as is, and we lost the use of Alpen Rose, which puts further strain on already outdated and unimproved assets we have in our community. And for the past three years, we hosted all of Lincoln's outdoor sports as they went through their rebuild. When IBW goes through our rebuild, it would be vital to have this project approved for our high school programming. Without it, we will have nowhere to go to provide safe and equitable spaces for our outdoor programming. Finally, with respect to the argument regarding off-gassing heat and microplastics, it is heard. But 
The technology has changed immensely and evolved over time that so many of these issues have been resolved. I would stress to invite the group to analyze the material used at the Lincoln site for further reference. I cannot stress the importance of this project. It is absolutely vital to the health and well-being of so many current students, student athletes, and future student athletes for our school and community. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Edward Kunal. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I... Yeah, I'm a lifelong uh, Southwest Portland resident. I went to Jackson Middle School back in the early 80s. I have had two children go through it, and I've spent a lot, a lot of hours there as a uh, parent volunteer, uh, youth athletic coach, and a uh, leader of, of non-sports youth activities. Um, you know, during the appeal process, I, I respect that, you know, people have their concerns, and, and I respect those people, but I heard children mentioned very little. Yeah, they didn't come up in the conversation. So let's let's what what are we weighing? The the, the there's going to be some negative effects of any plan that we put into action. I like this plan; it's a good plan. So, but what are we weighing it against? It's critical. It's critical for our children's emotional, physical, and psychological health that they have place that these num these places are disappearing. They're becoming more expensive and more rare in Southwest Portland. If we want to talk about how it's going to affect, you know families that don't have a lot of money it's going to affect them way more because those families don't have four thousand dollars to go to wilsonville and join a, a an inter, a national soccer travel team or practice in an indoor private indoor facility it's it, you know the family but they can hopefully play you know softball baseball football soccer whatever at their public school if there's field space and if the field space can be utilized more and yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't mean to criticize anybody, but I wish we cared about our kids in this city as much as we cared about the salamanders living at the goddamn tennis court. The tennis courts are only a, a, a marshland or whatever it is because of the dire neglect that took place. It, it should be a tennis court. It should be a place where kids are playing tennis. And I don't understand what the alternative is. Do we just never improve anything? Because you, never improve anything because we might inconvenience uh, you know, the salamanders at the tennis court. So we just declare the whole thing a swamp and tell all the kids to go home and that's it. And then watch the, the, the school building fall out on itself. And, and, you know, what do we do then? I don't know. But uh, please deny this appeal. Our students, for whom this school is supposed to serve, it's their primary purpose of the school and the grounds, is to serve the kids. And they need it desperately. And they can't be here at the meeting to advocate for themselves. And uh, I don't know, AstroTurf burns. My kids played since second grade. They played on every field at Stevenson, Jackson, and the turf field at Wells football. They didn't get burned, but they had a lot of fun. So I don't know what to tell you. They got exercise. Uh, you know, they made friends. They built confidence. And, uh, you know, they did twist their ankles when we're at Jackson, and there's gopher holes everywhere. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but. It's an embarrassment. Those fields are embarrassment. They need to be improved and they need to be added to. It's ridiculous that we wouldn't add any baseball fields. Our population hasn't shrunk. You know, we need, they need better facilities. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Shetler. Thank you, Dan Weber. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly in support of the approved turf plan at Jackson. My name is Dan Webert. I'm a board member for Wells Youth Baseball. I also uh, coach a group of 11-year-old baseball players who've been using Jackson for three years now, including the young man sitting next to me here getting a civics lesson. Um, Wells Youth Baseball serves our community's uh, spring and fall baseball players. This year, we expect to have uh, approximately 100 9 to 14 year old players enrolled in our spring program and something approaching that number uh, in our fall program. Jackson Middle School is our only facility. As with other uh, local sports in Southwest Portland, field scarcity and issues affecting uh, field playability have had a huge impact uh, on the opportunities for our children relative uh, to our neighbors in the suburbs. 
The southern field at Jackson is the only dedicated field that we have in our community large enough for seventh and eighth grade players. Uh, this year, we will have up to four teams sharing that field for games and practices. That may mean just one field practice per week uh, for each of those teams, where typically two or three uh, field practices per week would be more typical. The northern field at uh, what that we refer to as Jackson 2 is the only dedicated field we have available to us at an intermediate distance uh, for our fifth and sixth graders. And we'll have up to five teams uh, sharing that field uh, in some capacity. Uh, these two grass uh, baseball fields sit at the bottom of a poorly draining bowl. Uh, the existing decades old uh, drainage infrastructure is failing. Uh, irrigation is also a major uh, issue in the dry months. Uh, when it's wet, uh, typically uh, at the beginning of our season, uh, the field is essentially a swamp. Uh, and by that, I mean mud up to my shins, my boots getting stuck in the muck. We have grass, uh, sometimes even cattails uh, that gets up to our knees. Uh, that can't be cut because the, the fields are, are typically too wet uh, and too muddy. Uh, the fields typically aren't ready to play or practice until after the start of our season. Uh, in years past, we've, we've had to wait to schedule home games uh, until the fields dry out. I've personally had to beg for field time from uh, from neighboring programs uh, just to be able to get uh, my boys on the field on time. Uh, the swampy conditions uh, leads to holes and deep ruts uh, from walking, playing, and, and of course the grass cutting. Uh, this creates a safety issue when the fields do dry out. Uh, so there's basically a Goldilocks period of approximately six to eight weeks during which the field is both playable uh, and the grass is, is green and soft. Uh, the approved turf plan will add more usable all-weather space for our, our uh, child athletes and uh, add uh, much needed uh, facilities. Uh, thank you. Next up, we have Peyton Chapman. I don't feel like I'm here by myself anymore. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. My name is Peyton Chapman. I'm the principal of Lincoln High School, and I really appreciate um, the person who wanted to center children. I think that's the most important part of this conversation. And our city currently has a dearth of fields and courts and places for safe and supervised play. There's an increase in youth mental health concerns. It used to be that 10% of high school students would develop some kind of mental health concern, and that's up to about 35% uh, across our country now. Uh, developing health issues, the obesity rate is up, and as is the access to drugs and alcohol, there has never been a more important time for safe and supervised play of young, young people. We're in a crisis. Our city is losing families to the suburbs where communities are more family friendly or seem to be that way, and they advocate for more youth and family oriented facilities such as Tiger Tualatin Parks and Rec. We have to be that kind of a city. When we lose families, we lose our city's vibrancy and our multi-generational supports. We see that with declined enrollment too. Private schools have fields. The suburbs, Mountainside and Beaverton has added fields. We have to have fields if we wanna keep our public schools alive and our cities filled with children. In terms of environmental issues, some were mentioned, people are forced to drive added distances many times a day to suburban fields, adding to climate warming. I saw uh, Commissioner Gonzalez smile when he saw the young man who was in the background for the civics lesson. Children make us smile. We wanna have children in our city for the adults too. The new fields, we have one at Lincoln High School. We're so grateful to voters and taxpayers. We see children on it on weekends and during the day. It's made of wood pellets instead of the older recycled rubber grind and actually keeps the field cool in the summertime instead of heating to those old high temperatures that were discussed. We are, PPS is modeling better science for our youth and our students are talking about it, those wooden pellets instead of the old grind. In terms of equity, the current lack of facilities and fields forces youth to miss scarce instructional time in school. Without enough turf fields, the rain causes rescheduling and PPS and Parks and Rec, they don't have enough fields to limit games to after school times. Students at Westside schools are forced to miss half days just to compete in regular season games 
And students we host who come from schools such as Roosevelt or McDaniel or Jefferson are forced to miss entire school days of instructional time just to play enough regular state to qualify for regional and state playoffs. We're lucky in Oregon to have so many wild spaces from Tryon Creek to Forest Park and waterfront hiking trails and not to mention the gorge and Savi's Island and the beaches. Our children need safe spaces for physical play in our city and for healthy competition in family neighborhoods. They will learn to love the outdoors by being safe in the outdoors, doing what they love. They love soccer and football and ultimate frisbee and baseball and softball and lacrosse. And who doesn't love watching a summer game of Little League? We must prioritize our children and the joy that they deserve and all of us receive when we watch them play in our city. Thank you. Mayor, that completes testimony. All right, great. And thank you, Peyton, for uh, for uh, being there in person. I, I hope you were able to find a seat okay. I know sometimes <laughs> it's very competitive. Uh, so thank you, all of you, for your testimony. Um, legal counsel, did you want to go through, at this point, the new evidence, or should we wait till after Commissioner Fritz gives her uh, rebuttal. What's what is your preference? My preference is to wait until after rebuttal. I, I'd prefer that myself. Great. So now the appellant will be provided five minutes to give their rebuttal. Uh, welcome again to the representatives of the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association. And I think Commissioner Fritz, you are in that slot today. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just playing old Amanda Fritz today. All right. Very good. So good we. Just for the record, we do not believe there's anything new that's been introduced. There's a great volume of evidence in the record. We support uh, moving sports facilities out of school. And I'm speaking as the vice president of the West Portland Park Neighborhood Association. The approval criteria require that the renovations must not be at the expense of watershed health, site safety, or public access to the grounds. The application fails to meet the Southwest Community Plan watershed policies. Tryon Creek is a listed watershed with federally mandated protections. The proposal will increase the temperature and pollutant load of stormwater runoff due to more than seven acres of plastic carpet absorbing heat and shedding microplastics. There is currently no artificial turf on the site. If the natural grass is filtering runoff and no artificial turf is installed, there will be no microplastic pollution leaving the site. Documents in the records um, site studies showing that artificial turf leaches microplastics. And microplastics are included in measurements of total suspended solids. Proposed condition J um, requires the uh, a future determination compliance with this stormwater manu management manual. The problem with this condition is that it does not ensure the policies of the Southwest Community Plan are met. The stormwater management plan requires water quality treatment to remove only 70% of total suspended solid. Ali adding 30% of the new newly introduced microplastics leaching from the turf to, fall into, to flow into Falling Creek will increase water pollution, not decrease it as required by the Southwest Community Plan watershed policies. Ms. White now claims that the stormwater management manual requires 90% of total solid, uh, solid removal, which is not my reading of the document, but even so, 90% is not 100%. The hearings officer notes that artificial turf is used on many playing fields, including those owned by Portland Parks and Recreation. The difference here is that in this location is a this location is a headwaters site, and that a headwaters stream corridor in a listed watershed flows before, under, and under and after the site. Tryon Creek is a fish bearing stream and being small it is particularly sensitive to adverse impacts. Even moderate increases in temperature, bacterial and microplastic pollutions will be detrimental. What works at Dunaway Park close to the mighty Willamette would be devastating for Tryon Creek. If my kids were still playing on these fields, I'd want to know that the new construction is safe. BES notes that there is a risk for sinkholes if the stormwater pipe conveying Falling Creek is crushed by rock and fill. I'd like to know that the geotechnical experts have approved around 4,000 cubic yards of fill and the retaining walls necessary to hold it. This information is missing. The application states the existing grass playing fields are about 500,000 square feet 
and that 3,045 980 square feet would be switched to artificial turf if the application is approved. 300,000 is more than half the current grass area. EPS claims we appealed based on the new environmental zone not applicable to this case. The appeal does not assert that the environmental zone rules apply. It references Southwest Community Plan and open space purpose statements broadly protecting fragile and sensitive areas, not environmental zones. Regard, regardless of your, oh, the application states it plans to fence the entire area. PPS now says it doesn't plan to fence the entire area, but that's not what the application says. A condition of approval is needed to limit fencing. Regardless of your decision today, we ask that Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Ryan request and the council approve funding for a code update project to revise the conditional use master plan standards and approval criteria. It's, appall it's appalling that with all the impacts of global warming and its effects on the natural and built environments becoming increasingly apparent, the, the conditional use master plan process doesn't include direct consideration of climate or environmental impacts of proposals on large campus sites. We further ask Commissioner Matz to direct an update to the stormwater management manual to add because the Southwest Community Plan applies, and because the Triangle Creek watershed has protections, we have been able to show why the application must be denied. Other areas of the city without such community plans would not be so fortunate. Finally, we commend both BDS planner Andrew Galizia and the council clerk and her staff for their exemplary professionalism in assisting us with technical difficulties. When I say that, I mean my technical difficulties. Very good. And uh, thank you again. Once again, perfect timing. <clears throat> Colleagues, so that uh, completes the public participation portion on this uh, of this on the record hearing. I'll open the floor for council discussion. But before that, I've been pinged by Lindley to make a couple of comments uh, on behalf of our legal team. Lindley, go ahead. Yes, as we've as I've said way too many times in this hearing, it is an on the record hearing. And so staff and I have been working through the hearing to try to identify in oral testimony any specific facts or some specific new evidence that we've heard that we believe may be new evidence. I'm going to identify that for the council. Um, and I would ask that council move and second to reject any evidence, and I'll give you some language for that, but let me go through the, the six particular items I've identified at this point. Um, in the uh, presentation from appellant's supporters, there was oral testimony regarding communications with a manufacturer, and staff did not find that information previously in the record. And recognizing as uh, Commissioner Fritz uh, identified it is a large record. So we're we're doing what we can on the fly. Item two, um, one testifier mentioned specific city investments and dollar amounts for salmon habitat uh, to staff's awareness that was not previously in the record. Um, if, and again, when I'm done with these, if the appellant or the applicant say, staff attorney, you're wrong, please, please let us know. Third, um, in the Portland Public Schools introductory statement about Portland Public Schools planning, and there was information in there that we believe was not previously in the record. There was information from one testifier about Ida B. Wells being under construction and, and it creating need. That fact was uh, not previously in the record. Fifth, um, one testifier identified specific numbers of fields that that are needed for certain age groups. Uh, it's our understanding that was not previously in the record. And finally, there were some mental health statistics that were cited that we do not believe were previously in the record. And I realize this is really granular, but it, it's our job to identify that for you. Um, I'd ask the applicant and appellant if they have any anything, if they disagree with our characterization of the new evidence. Uh, could you just clarify which um, consultant you believe it's not in the record? Um, I don't, I, I actually, both staff and I did not, were not able to cap, catch notes on who that was. There was a um, some communication with the manufacturer, I believe of, um, 
I'm, I am not sure, Commissioner Fritzen. So we, if we need to, we'll clarify that in the fi in the findings. So we'll yeah. we'll have time before we draft the findings to go back and confirm. And so we'll clarify that in the findings. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, okay, if there are no other comments, I would ask council to make a motion and second and agree, you can either do it by consensus or vote, that to the extent there are new facts or other new evidence in the oral statements today or submitted written testimony, the council intends to reject and will not consider that evidence as part of their final decision, and that will be reflected in the findings. So moved. Commissioner Maps moves, and can I get a second, please? Uh, Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion on this item? Call the roll. Camille. Aye. Ryan. I want to thank everybody for uh, being here today. It was very educational, and I am uh, satisfied, and uh, I, I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Miller. All right, motion carries. So now we're at the public or the, the deliberation part of the hearing council uh, or questions that you may have, Commissioner Maps. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'd like to talk to uh, city staff. Um, and in particular, um, I'm hoping that we can pull up the slideshow that I think we began the day on. Um, and maybe it's on the second or third slide. Um, there is a list of criteria that I think council is supposed to consider as we um, make these decisions today. Okay, is that? Uh, this one? Yeah, yes, so just so, so I'm clear, um, Today, I think I've heard a lot about the pros and cons of this particular project. However, it's also my understanding that council's job today is not necessarily to design the um, the optimal uh, uh, um, way to go about approving these fields. Rather, um, we're basically looking at a, a set of, of uh, process questions. Is that correct? In other words, specifically, what questions is council supposed to rule on today? I think uh, council's decision would be based on the approval criteria on this slide. Great. On this slide, public services, livability impacts, and Southwest community plan. All right, thank you. Can you can we rotate back to the first one uh, just real quickly? I'd just like to take. Certainly, I'll start at the very beginning to so make sure I'm not missing anything you wanted to see. Okay. Um, it's the site, photographs. So right. this, these are the criteria for the master plan. Right. These criteria for the master plan refer in criterion B to the conditional use criteria, which are these four. Okay. Character and impacts, public services, livability, and Southwest community plan. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to take uh, a second look at those uh, um, before we got into our conversations today. Uh, thank you very Certainly. much. Certainly. Uh, I had a couple of questions and I'll just go through them. First of all, there was much discussion. And again, this is for city staff. There was a lot of discussion about stormwater management and one component that uh, Christy White mentioned was that there was no evidence in the record that stormwater management conditions were not met. And I assume that is the position of city staff as well. Is that correct? I, I think that that's correct. I'm not aware of any specific evidence that talked about the stormwater plan as not not meeting technical requirements. I think there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of discussion about information that folks thought was missing or inadequate. But I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, I'd see if Ella Ruth in BES has anything she'd like to add to that. She was uh, most involved in reviewing the stormwater aspect of this, and she's here today, if that was okay, to uh, ask her if she has any comments as well. 
Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. This is Ella Ruth. I was the the um, BES planner for the conditional use review. And um, I guess I could provide a little bit of uh, detail on this. Um, the first round of um, submittals was a stormwater report that um, I did not recommend approval on because uh, there was I needed additional information to make sure that the stormwater management manual requirements had been met. Um, so they came back with the second iteration, um, which they they did show that all of the water quality and flow control requirements of the stormwater management manual were were met. Um, there was oh sorry go ahead no go ahead there you continue sorry. Um, I think some of the testimony implied that um, that there was not enough uh, vegetated facilities, for example, or or that the type of facility um, relative to the groundwater did not uh, meet BES requirements. Um, but I can go into detail on how uh, how they do meet BES requirements. If folks no, it's, no, just just I I really wanted the top line. You know, do they, from your perspective as a representative of the city's, you know, uh, infrastructure, do you, do you see that they did meet those criteria? Did they yes. meet the criteria? They did. Yes. Okay. And I, what I heard in testimony, and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I did hear concerns about, and I think Christy was the one who also mentioned this in. Uh, her presentation, but I know several people uh, on behalf of the appellant testified concerns about the condition of the pipe. And Christy, maybe this is a question for you. Uh, I heard you say you would be willing to accept an additional condition to, quote, evaluate, unquote, the condition of the pipe. Um, so I guess my question is, if you evaluate the pipe and it turns out that it is not in adequate condition to do what it needs to do, what are you proposing would happen? Thank you for the question. Um, again, we submitted the exact language of this on October 20th, 2023 in our second rental sub record submittal. And what that condition says is that we have to evaluate it and that prior to the issuance of the first permit, so for the first field, we have to obtain BES approval for any necessary work on the pipe as a result of the proposed development. Ah, and okay, so yeah. so that, that and that's helpful. Thank you. That answers yeah. my question. And okay. and this may may seem like a small question in the scheme of things, but uh, I've learned over seven years here that porta potties are very important to our community, uh, either pro or con. And I, I heard somebody say, and I honestly can't remember if it was you, Christy, or somebody else, said that there would be adequate facilities for the increased number of people who would be there. Uh, but I, I have a question about who who is responsible for that? Is it PPS who will own and maintain those facilities or who, whose job is that going to be? I, I just want to know in advance. Yeah, let me. OK, I'm not on mute. Um, Heidi Bertman is on from PPS. And so I hate to talk about PPS managed porta potties without her. Um, but so she can step in on the management part. But I know PPS will be providing them based on the expected demand on the site and provide those exterior to the building. Heidi, if you're on, you might be able to talk about how those are managed. R really, I'm interested in who's responsible. Who, yeah, who just manages. at a high level, uh, PBS, uh, Portland Interscholastic League manages, generally speaking, the use of the athletic fields for that programming. And we do this on a lot of our other fields. They will schedule, um, including the regular maintenance schedule, uh, porta potties for to be adjacent to our fields. And so they're monitored, scheduled, and the contract is arranged through PIL's work. Okay. And and is it and, and legal counsel will jump in if this is not an appropriate question because it may not have anything to do with the approval. Um, but I, I assume you will work with the neighborhood on the location of said porta potties. For certain. Okay, good. Because I, I can just tell you, we as a city place porta potties, and and it's very very important to neighborhoods that they have a say 
in where they go. So um, I just want to make that clear. <laughs> Good. And um, the livability portion of this, and then I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues. You know, there, there are a lot of criteria around livability, and I'll just pick on one just because I'm interested in it, and that is noise. How does one meet the livability requirement around noise? Are there specific measurable requirements, or is that more of a subjective requirement? Is that a question for the applicant? or the I, I don't know who it's a question for, to be honest, but uh, somebody who's an expert who is uh, on the applicant side of the equation. Okay, I think I can answer that. I'm not sure I'm a noise expert, but I, I'm very sure I'm an expert in how this has been applied in okay. previous field cases. And the, um, if it's amplified noise, it has to meet the city's noise standards. Okay. If it's non-amplified noise, there's timing that we comply with in terms of when if, when the fields are locked down and ah, people are okay. removed from fields. And there's no amplified noise on these fields. Okay, so uh, as as long as that then is enforced, the time restriction, that would yeah. comply with the livability requirement of the conditions. Is that correct? At least the that's noise correct. portion. Okay, that's yeah. helpful to me. Good. I'll turn this over to Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you. I'll be quick so we can get to Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, during testimony, we heard a lot of concern about the um, condition of the pipe that conveys the creek underneath the field. And I was really glad to hear, I think, Christy say that uh, the school district was um, willing to at least investigate the condition of that pipe. Uh, and maybe this is a question from um, the city's lawyers. I think we might have Lindley uh, up today. Is that already written into the agreement in terms of investigating the condition of the pipe? No, it's not. My understanding, it is not currently a condition of approval. The hearings officer did not apply it. Um, the applicant is offering that um, as an additional condition. So I don't know what council would, if council wished to impose that condition, you would need to, you know, in your in your tentative voting, if you were up to uphold the hearings officer decision, you'd uphold it with additional conditions. Uh, um, thank you very much, um, colleagues. I. It seemed like uh, um, it, formally investigating the condition of the pipe uh, seems like a shared concern and a win-win. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that happens, um, which maybe has some implications for uh, uh, how we vote today. Uh, and with that, I will lower my hand and hand the floor. Over. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. I had a threshold question actually on the pipe. So the pipe, uh, can we show the image where the pipe is located? I think there was one in the applicant's testimony that shows the location of the pipe. I think this is in staff's zoning map generally. I didn't have a, an image in mind that showed the location of the pipe. So what yeah, was, the zoning what, map shows point A to point B, really. You see where the, the creek um, hits the northern boundary of the property, and then you see where it outputs on the southern boundary of the property, and it basically bisects that the campus and that area under underground. Got it. And so the image I'm thinking of that I thought was in the applicant's uh, materials, there's a there's a demonstration in the very north part of the image that's in green. What, what were you showing us there then? I oh, just want to make uh, sure I was following. Okay, that's the area of um, environmental zoning on the property that was highlighted in blue. Got it, got it. Um, what would the, what, do you have any idea what the building off Commissioner Maps inquiry, uh, the, the cost and the timing would be involved in inspecting the pipe. But what, what is, have you scoped that at all? And that may be new evidence that we need to be clear about. I just want to understand the impact of that um, on, on the school district. Thank you for the question. I think it would be new evidence for me to introduce that. So I want to respect the, the record process. And, but I, I will say that because these fields aren't finally designed, in other words, we haven't picked the materials mm. the field or the substrate, those will all have a different weight implication. So it once the, the, the most cost efficient thing to do is wait to see 
what that final design is and what the substrate material is so that we can determine weight, so that we can determine what kind of investigation needs to occur. Okay, got it, got it. And then um, I'm looking at the terms of the initial appeal and there, um, there seems to be some factual disagreement on how fencing is going to work here. What What is, I guess, can we get clarification on what is the expectation there? Because when we're talking about open spaces and school property, it has some interesting implications. But I, yeah. I just, what is, what is the current plan? And I, I'll just read you specifically. The hearings officer's decision approves fencing the entire site, which will further detract from the purpose of the open space zone. And I just want to be clear on what the what the decision was this is much for city staff as the applicant but uh, on that on that point well and that might be you know this conditional use master plan is an iterative process and so it can change over time what what is being proposed i think it's fair to say that the initial documentation may have shown fencing around the entire site but that's not the current proposal um, fencing also is just a matter of right uh, on the base zone standards, so you can just do that. You don't need a conditional use master plan to do it. But our current proposal is to not perimeter fence the site and to not gate or block the public trail that bifurcates the site. Where fencing would be used is to control um, ball spill from the athletic facilities. There would be interior perimeter fencing of certain facilities. And then, of course, if the school, um, if whatever happens and the school has a need for safety reasons to do more fencing, they would, of course, seek a permit if they needed to from the city for that fencing. Got it. Got it. Um, I think I am good for now. Thank you. All right. Very good, Commissioner. Uh, anybody else? Good, Jen. Just a reminder uh, now that uh, council has concluded its discussion, I'm going to ask for a motion to dispose of the appeal. And there's a couple of choices here just to remind everybody. The council can either move to tentatively deny the appeal, uphold the decision of the hearings officer, and ask the applicant and or staff to return with revised findings or the council can move to tentatively grant the appeal, overturn the decision of the hearings officer, and ask staff to return with revised findings. And at this point, I would ask if anybody would like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion. I would move then that, uh, and again, this is a tentative vote. Uh, I would move to tentatively deny the appeal, uphold the decision of the hearings officer, and ask the applicant and or staff to return with revised findings. Uh, but I would also be interested in adding the additional condition that Christy had suggested if there is an interest on the part of the council, because I think it, as Commissioner Mapp said, sounds like a win-win to me. If we're going to re uh, renovate the uh, top strata of the field, we, this is our best and most cost-effective and sensible opportunity to look at the, the stormwater drainage under the field. Commissioner Maps, uh, I support that. I support that. Uh, I don't know if that's a, if that is your motion and the lawyers think it's okay, I'll second that. Well, I always turn to Lindley on things like this. Is that sufficient, Lindley, as a motion, or do I need a specific amendment related to the added condition? No, it. I think it's it's clear that your it contains a denial of the appeal, uphold the hearings officer, and ask asking the applicant both to add the condition that she read into the record and that was proposed on October twentieth, twenty twenty three and to have the applicant to prepare revised findings and work with staff to bring those back. All right, very good. And Commissioner Maps, is that, can I take that as a second to my motion? Yeah, you sure can. Uh, can I ask a clarifying question though? Is this, should we consider this a preliminary vote? Or, yes, or, or, yes, okay. this is, yeah, under, under our land use, uh, policy, this is actually a tentative vote, and we'll come back on a time certain to take the final vote. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, that works for me. Okay. So at this point, I would just ask council, is there any further discussion on the motion? Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. 
Yeah, I just want to be crystal clear that I understand the the timing and cost impacts on the applicant for that additional condition. I think we partially got the answer, but I just uh, I, I I certainly appreciate the spirit of this. But if we're really not going to go know the impact on the pipe until we're bringing back individual fields, I'm the one part of logic that I'm not entirely following is why would we insist on this now or would we make it as a condition as each field comes back? That was the um, uh, that I'm just trying to clarify. What's the right timing for inspecting the pipe uh, for this assessment? Am, am I allowed to respond to that? Yeah, Christy, you're, you probably know as much as anybody on this. Um, well, the condition itself imposes the timing, which is prior to our first conditional use okay. master plan I'm improvement. So we you? would be designing, um, we would, it's self-imposed, we'd be designing the project and through that design, normal due diligence would have us looking at this pipe. So it's going to come at a time when we have a project. And, and where I'm going to my colleagues is I um, I appreciate the spirit of doing this diligence. Uh, I also, given the long timeline for developing these types of fields, don't want to disrupt the flow and and the, the overall timing of the project. Um, so that's I'm just trying to thread that needle. How do we assure that this diligence is being done, but not unnecessarily delay the the project? Yeah, very much appreciate that and the sensibility of that in imposing a condition of approval and the way we drafted this um, met our concerns and considerations about the timing of when these costs would be imposed on the, on the school district. Mayor, does that align from your vantage point with the condition that you were considering in your motion? Yeah, I, I think uh, that the... Uh, the applicant is offered what I think is a very wise uh, amendment, and and frankly, I appreciate it. Uh, they're acknowledging that if we're going to go through the renovation, let's make sure the substructure is sufficient. Everybody hates it when the city repaves the street and then tears it up three months later because a pipe underneath it needs to be replaced. Uh, this is an analogous situation. It's been offered by the applicant, presumably, as Christy just said, with the assumption that this does not significantly or maybe even in any way disrupt their schedule. So I, I certainly uh, accept the offer they put on the table. That's how I view it. And I guess my only question was to Lindley is it, from your vantage point, is there any ambiguity on this? I just don't want to get some weird gotcha later on that we're um, so if it's crystal clear to you that we're the condition is the one that the applicant proposed and um, just one asking confirmation of ambiguity there. Yeah, I think um, I would actually ask Andrew Galizia to weigh in since he's, I, I have not seen the condition before, so I want to make sure it's clear to BDS staff what it is and that it is implementable. Yeah, I think I remember this, the wording of this condition being offered, and uh, it's, it's clear. I think uh, something that maybe be lost is there's two pipes. There's a sanitary sewer main under the site, and then there's the pipe that carries, conveys the stream. There's already a condition of approval that the applicant inspect the sanitary sewer pipe, and this would be aligned, aligned with that. So I think it would be clear. Okay, I'm good. Good. Uh, Commissioner Maps, you had your hand up, but I see you took it down. Anything else on this? I think my um, issue got addressed in that exchange. Okay. Good. Uh, then with that, Keelan, please call the roll on the tentative decision. Camille. I too am inclined to deny this appeal and um, support uh, the direction. So I am an I. Brian. Yes, I am an I as well. I really appreciate the conversation about the pipe. Uh, that was the one note I had down. Thank you, Mayor, for handling that so well and also the spirit of cooperation with you, Commissioner Maps. I really appreciate the testimony from both sides today. I don't think anyone was anti-children and families. I think everyone wants more sport and recreation, but we also wanna make sure these pipes um, for our 
precious waterways Tryon and Pano Creek are taken care of well. Seems like we got to a sensible place. And I really appreciate the testimony, especially about children and families and the need uh, for uh, more play spaces and sport activity. I hear it every day from friends who complain about um, our conditions when it comes to our sports fields compared to our surrounding suburbs. So I told myself anytime I could be a voice for this reason, I would um, advocate for it. And I'm delighted to, I get to do that for the good people in Southwest Portland. Um, I vote I. Gonzalez. Let them build, let them play. I vote I. Apps. Um, I want to thank everyone who testified today. Um, and uh, I, I think this was a good exchange. I agree with, I believe, Commissioner Ryan um, in that I see a consensus that people want to both protect our environment and support our children. Um, I think the uh, motion on the table today moves us in that direction, which is why I vote aye. Miller. I vote aye. The motion to deny the appeal passes 5-0. The appeal is tentatively denied. Uh, so now to the council clerk and city attorney, do we have a date and time certain for this matter to return to the city council for a final vote and adoption of the findings? Um, Keelan, typically we ask for about three weeks. Um, before I do that, though, we do have a 120 day uh, expiration on January 22nd. So before we talk about a date that might extend beyond that, I want to confirm with the applicant that they would agree to extend the clock and then we'll have them sign it, uh, an extension with BDS. Yes, we will agree to extend the clock to get these findings drafted. And also to the applicant, um, does that timeline work for you where we would be um, completing, we would need to file the findings um, by either the, probably the 29th or 30th of January? Yes. Okay, so Keelan, do we have something on the 31st, or if not, then on the 1st? On the 31st, we could do 10-10. Let, let's take that, please. All right, very good. Uh, thank you. Then this item is continued to January 31st at 10-10 a.m. time certain. And Lindley, that completes everything we need to do on this hearing today? It does. All right. Very good. Thank you to everybody who testified. Thank you to staff. Thank you to everybody else. We are adjourned. Thank you.